Jordan L. Rice is a Christ follower, husband to Jessica, dad to Jameson and Josiah, native New Yorker, an attorney, widower, a hopeless Knicks fan, and a church planter. While in college, Jordan became a Christ follower, began teaching a Bible study, and shortly thereafter discovered a desire to pursue ministry. Notwithstanding that desire, Jordan completed law school, and after finding himself unable to fulfill his aspiration for ministry, he enrolled in seminary. Along with the aid of the Holy Spirit, his wife Jessica, and a diverse group of committed adults, Jordan launched Renaissance Church in September 21st, 2014. Renaissance Church has grown over these past five years to have influence in the lives of thousands throughout New York City and beyond. They're committed to being a church for people that are the farthest away from the gospel, contributing to the rich and beautiful tradition of gospel-centered churches in Harlem. So give a warm Eastview welcome to Pastor Jordan Rice. Now, I have to confess, uh, I have some pretty weird friends. Uh, they say birds of a feather flock together, but I hope that's not always true. Uh, a couple years ago, one of my friends got on this big, uh, big financial kick to get out of debt. And uh, my wife and I went to go see him, and right as soon as he started the program, and as soon as we walked in the house, it was one of those situations where it was colder inside the house than it was outside the house. And I was like, dude, I think your, your heat is broken. He says, no, 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 we set it to 50. I was like, 50, that's generous. Thank you for that. <laughs> uh, that was just the beginning of a very long weekend. I, I later realized that in a further pursuit to save money, he and his wife went to Costco to buy the most affordable food that they could find to get out of debt as fast as possible. While I was there, they had gone to Costco and bought hundreds and hundreds of hot dogs. <laughs> and there was hot dogs for every meal. For breakfast, hot dogs and eggs. For lunch, hot dogs on a bun with potato chips. And for dinner, surprisingly, we had lobster. No, I'm kidding. It was hot dogs. Again, hot dogs and spaghetti for, for dinner. As we were nearing our third hot dog meal of the day, uh, I saw my friend starting to warm up to deliver me his pitch on this new financial program uh, he was doing. And I said, hey, you know what? I'm going to cut you off right there. Uh, it's not you. It's me. I have this weird hereditary thing that I can't eat hot dogs for a month straight. Uh, so no matter how much money you're saving, I would rather have Sally Mae on my back until I'm 90 <laughs> than do what you're doing right now. Now, as the years have gone on, I've realized that some of the things that he was doing was like really good like budgeting, right? <laughs> budgeting is like a really good thing. If you want to have like a good financial direction, you need a budget. You need to plan how much money is coming in, how much is going out, how much are we saving, how much are we giving. Like budgeting is a really good thing. But for years, I thought that like budgeting was a gateway drug in, into eating hot dogs for a month straight. And I was <laughs> thrilled to not have a budget because of the representation that he presented. Because he represented it in such a way, I wanted nothing to do with anything uh, about it, and I missed out on a lot of good stuff in the meantime. Now, when I first became a Christian, the way that certain things were represented didn't feel like they would have any place in my life. One of those things was being a witness for Jesus. Uh, the way that I had seen it practiced was people uh, standing in the subway terminal, the subway station, yelling at people, and it just didn't feel like it was anything that could uh, have any place in my life. And for a lot of years, I was very content to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Now, this is really important because today we're talking about your influence, uh, being a dangerous witness for Christ. And I, I hope that some of you didn't come in the room today thinking about that term witness from a loaded perspective, uh, because it certainly carries a, a lot of baggage for some people. Uh, let me define what being a witness is. It can be defined as our human effort of talking about Jesus and trusting and praying that God will supernaturally use our human means to affect his divine purposes. Now, it's important that you think about it this way, because you being a dangerous witness has way less to do with you and everything to do with the power that's inside of you. Amen. 
Paul reminds us in Romans 8 and 11, one of the most profound passages in all of the Bible, that uh, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through his spirit who lives in you. The same power that was required to raise Jesus from the dead lives inside of everyone who, who has placed their faith in Christ. You did not receive a bootleg spirit. When I was about 12 years old, my brother and I would take the train to Fordham Road. It's a shopping area in the Bronx in New York City. And uh, I was about 12, my brother was about 15. And the guy, got, uh, the guy standing near the, the train station knew that we were suckers. And uh, as soon as we walked away from the train station, he says, hey, I just took this chain from Macy's. It's worth $700, but for you, I will let it go for, how much money do you have? 20 bucks, that's how much we'll let it go for. My, I was so happy, I bought that chain, uh, don't judge me, um, and <laughs> man, you couldn't tell me nothing. That first day I wore that chain to school, and that joint was shining, and you know, I wore it, I had my collar popped up, and the chain wrapped around my collar, and it looked absolutely beautiful. Uh, the next week, it started to turn a little bit. I was like, wait, does gold turn? Maybe I need to polish this. I thought that was silver, but I don't know. And eventually, two or three weeks later, uh, that brilliant gold chain turned to uh, forest green. It was <laughs> completely chipped, and I realized that I had bought a, a bootleg chain. Now, here's the thing about a bootleg. Bootlegs don't last. They might look good for a little bit, they might have a little shine, a little luster, but they don't last. They cannot withstand the elements. What is Paul saying about the Spirit of God that lives inside of you? You did not receive a bootleg spirit. You did not receive a, a spirit that cannot withstand the elements, the, the, the ups and the downs of life. What you have inside of you is the power of God, and that makes us dangerous. So Paul gives us this because one of the things I know to be true, that if you and I do not remember God's power, you and I will always dwell on our inability. Uh, there's two things that you can focus on. You can focus on God's power or your inability, and you and I absolutely need, need to remember God's power that's living on the inside of us. Now, with all that being said, it still comes with its fair share of challenges to be a, a witness. Um, man, in, in New York City, one of those big challenges I was just talking to Mike in the back, uh, is that in New York, people just don't want you to talk about Jesus. Like, it's cool if that's your thing, right? But like, just don't, don't bring that to me. Like, if you want to have Jesus, knock yourself out, but just please don't bring that uh, in my direction. And one of the things I, I found to be so hypocritical about that is, we don't do that with anything else in society, right? Like, anything else that's serious or that really matters, we don't do that with anything else in society. Uh, this past Monday, uh, our country celebrated Martin Luther King Jr. Day, and we celebrate that nationally because we believe that everyone in our society should be valued not based on the color of their skin, but rather the content of their character. And in New York City, no one, and I mean no one, will say, you know what? Racism is a bad thing for me, but hey, if you want to be a racist, that's cool. Do your thing. Nobody would say that. We all realize that whenever the stakes are high, we should be spreading that message as far and wide and passionately as possible. If what Jesus has said about himself is true, then the stakes are incredibly high. If without him means eternal separation from God, then we cannot be neutral. The stakes are too high. Now that leads us to a second problem. Since so many people don't want you talking about Jesus, they don't want you talking about their faith, uh, what that does is it gives people a version of Christianity that says, I can have private affection without public devotion. That I could love Jesus privately, but that will not make itself into the public day-to-day -day affairs of my life. And here's what I know to be absolutely true. Anyone or anything that you love privately should eventually be something you're proud to talk about publicly. Anyone or anything you're proud of, that you love privately should eventually be something you are proud to talk about publicly. Now, I hope I don't get anybody in trouble in, in, on this right here, but ladies, don't ever date a dude who's like whispering all of these sweet nothings in your ear in private, and then in public, he doesn't want anything to do with you. I'm not saying the first day y'all need to be on, on Instagram holding hands together, but eventually, at some point, anything or anyone that you love privately 
anything or anyone that you love privately should be something you're proud to talk about publicly. And some people have a version of Christianity that says, I can have a private love for Jesus that doesn't lead to public devotion. And that's just not healthy. No relationship, we would say, would be healthy if it was, there was private affection, but there's no public devotion. If you and I hang out and we're eating chicken wings, watching the Knicks lose, uh, you, <laughs> you wouldn't make it 10 minutes without hearing me talk about my wife and my kids because it's just natural. It flows out of us. And one of the things I think is the biggest obstacle to our being a witness is that sometimes we don't have the private love that we, say we, that we think we do. So I want us to get into a text today that's going to help us and turn us into dangerous witnesses uh, for Jesus. And it comes out of the, the Gospel of John. And it, uh, it starts off uh, talking about a, a Samaritan woman. And let me catch you guys up a little bit on the story. Uh, Jews and Samaritans were two very different groups uh, of people. Um, they had nothing to do with each other. Jesus goes to a well at about noon, and he meets with the woman in John 4. And the woman is stunned. And she says, you know, what are you, a Jew, doing talking to me, a uh, Samaritan? Jesus lets her know about the living water that he offers. And then he turns the conversation very personal to her and talks about her, her own relationship life and her love life. And he says, where's your husband? She says, I don't have one. He says, oh, I know you've had five. Um, and uh, this woman is now convinced that Jesus is the Messiah. And we pick up the text in verse 25. And it says, the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Jesus told her, I, the one speaking to you, am he. Just then, his disciples arrived. And they were amazed that he was talking with the woman. Yet no one said, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Then the woman left her water jar, went into town and told the people, come see a man who told me everything that I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They left the town and made their way to him, which is Jesus. Picking up in 39. Now many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of what the woman said when she testified. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two more days. Many more believed because of what he said. And they told the woman, we no longer believe because of what you said, since we have heard for ourselves and know that this is really the savior of the world. Now, I want to draw out three things and three implications from the text about, as we talk today about being a dangerous witness, uh, and three misunderstandings about what it is uh, we're talking about today that I think will help us to maximize our influence in every single setting that we're in. The first is that we, we misunderstand what it means to be a witness. We misunderstand God's heart, and we misunderstand the gospel. Uh, number one, we misunderstand what it means to be a witness I mentioned earlier that, to me earlier, I, I would have said earlier in my faith walk with Jesus, I would have thought that being a witness meant standing up on a stage maybe and talking to people about Jesus. Or I would have thought that it just meant talking to random strangers on a street, and um, that's not the totality of what we're, 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 we're being told is a witness in the story. Uh, being a witness is primarily relational. And this woman in this town, in verses 28 through 30, we see her go to people in the town that she had a relationship with. And we knew that uh, she knew the people because her method of evangelizing to them was saying, listen, come and meet a man who told me about everything that I did. Now, most scholars will say that the reason this woman was going to the well at noon was because she was trying to avoid the crowds of people who would go to the wells early in the morning. She very likely had a lot of baggage and issues in her life, and she didn't want to be caught uh, being seen around other people, so she just wanted to be left to herself. So she goes to this group of people in, in town, and she says, come meet a man who told me everything that I did. Her story was something that was well known, very likely well known to the people in town, and she's going to people that she probably knows. The people that God are, is probably calling you to be uh, a witness to, uh, they're likely far from him, but they're, they're close to you. There's so many people that are far from God, but they're, they're close to you. And to be a, a witness is primarily relational. Number two, it's, it's not also not also for the, for the super Christian. Here's a, a couple of really terrible things that I think a lot of Christians believe. We think that in order to be a witness for Jesus, you need to be special. You need to be better than someone else, or you need to be smarter. 
You need to be special. You need to be better. You need to be smarter. And this woman, this amazing evangelist, this amazing witness for Jesus, she's none of those things. She's not better than them, and she's not pretending she's better than them. She's not special. She's not pretending she's special. She's not smarter than them. She's not pretending to be these things. All she knows is she is a person who has been in contact with this Jesus, and it leads her out to other people. So for you to be a witness, it's not for you to be a, a, a super Christian, but it's for everyone, no matter where you're at, no matter what your story is. How tragic would it be if this woman would let her past keep her from sharing the good news of Jesus? Now, in other scriptures in the Bible, we get some looks at what it specifically means for us with real practical step-by-step -step, um, application to how you can be a dangerous witness in your context tonight. Uh, one of these scriptures comes to us in Colossians 4. Paul says, devote yourselves to prayer. Stay alert in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open up a door for us to speak the word to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains, so that I may make it known as I should. Act wisely toward outsiders, making the most of time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer each person." Now, here in Colossians, Paul, Paul gives us a model of what it means for you and me to be dangerous witnesses. Now, on one hand, Paul is convinced that there are people in the body of Christ who are gifted evangelists, who their job is to speak to oftentimes strangers and explain the mystery of Christ. And Paul is one of these people. Their job is to travel through regions and to preach and teach about Jesus. Now, as Paul says in Colossians 4, for those people, these people who are called and these evangelists, our responsibility is for us to, to pray for them to exercise that gift. Secondly, pray that they are bold and they take the opportunities. And thirdly, to, ask for, to pray that they are clear in their talking about Jesus. Uh, whenever Pastor Mike is on stage, and if you're ever wondering what you can pray for him, you can pray those three things for, for Pastor Mike. Pray that he has opportunities to exercise his gift and pray that he's bold to take those opportunities and pray that he's clear whenever he's talking to people about Jesus. Now, for the rest of us, Paul says, uh, here's what I want you to do. The first thing is, I want you to devote yourself to prayer. Paul, uh, in this text, doesn't say, now, I want you also to be clear in your presentation uh, of Jesus. He gives them a different formula. He says, the first thing I want you to do is I want you to devote yourself to prayer. And I was thinking about it. Why is it that Paul talks about devoting yourself to prayer? And what does it mean to devote yourself to prayer? Devoting yourself to prayer means not that you prayed one day or one week, but that it's the regular habit of your life that you're praying for someone to come to faith. And here's why. Every person who comes to faith is a miracle. Every person who comes, people can come to church because there was a good advertisement. People who come to faith, who come to embrace, the, who come to have the spirit of the living God living inside of them, for every single person, that is a miracle. You want to know why? Because that person has gone from death to life, is what scripture says. In John 5, when Jesus talks about it, John 5, 24, Jesus says, Truly, I tell you, anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not come under judgment, but has passed from death to life. It's a miracle every time someone comes to faith. They're not going to come to faith because you memorize a good script. They're going to come to faith because God has made them alive, as, as it says in Ephesians 2. So the first thing we need to do is to devote yourself to prayer. And, and one thing I was thinking about as I even prepared for today um, were the times I've, I've given up on prayer for people. People who I, I was praying for, um, neighbors and friends, and I didn't see anything happen. And then before I know it, they kind of fell to the bottom of my prayer list. And for some of those people, I've, I've stopped praying for them. And I was just reminded today to devote yourself to prayer, to, for, for me to devote myself to prayer for them. The second thing, uh, Paul says, is to be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. So to be wise in the way that you act toward outsiders. Uh, one thing that I've come to know is that nobody will want to know what you think about God or Jesus if they know that you are the office gossip. If we're not wise in the way that we act towards outsiders, uh, if, we're not making, if we're not wise in the way that we act toward outsiders, uh, in some ways we're damaging our, our witness and Paul continues, he says, to make the most out of every opportunity. 
Now, this is a, an interesting one because this doesn't mean that you should Jesus juke every conversation, um, <laughs> right? And you've been, who's been Jesus juked? Anybody have been Jesus juked before? <laughs> It's not a fun thing when someone just turns like they bang a hard left. And you're like, dude, how did we get there from a conversation about Tostitos? I didn't know how we got to, to that, to Jesus from that. That's a gift, bro. That's a gift. <laughs> uh, but if you pay attention, there are opportunities that you can live your faith in such a way um, and you can make a most, the most out of every opportunity. Uh, when I was practicing law, uh, we would get pretty close with other attorneys um, and from time to time, we would just be sitting in a back room waiting for our cases to get called. And after we talked about how crazy our cases were, eventually at some point the conversation would turn to our lives. And one of my coworkers started to mention that her parents, one of her parents was really ill and she was really stressed out going back and forth to the facility and looking after them. And I said, hey, what's your, what's your dad's name? And she told me her dad's name. I said, hey, you know what? I'm going to pray for him. And she says, oh, thank you. And she was kind of taken aback. And then the next time we, we had court and I saw, I said, hey, how's your dad so-and-so doing? Um, I was praying for him. And that opened up a door for us to talk about life and faith and Jesus in ways that all I did was just make the most out of every opportunity. She, talked to, she opened up the door to talk about something and I offered prayer. I've been around a lot of people and very, very, very few people, if you're being a really good listener, will refuse prayer. The first step is to, when you're making the most out of every opportunity, is to be an active listener. An active listener doesn't listen just to respond. An active listener listens to listen. And after you have listened and you've taken it in to offer someone the gift of prayer, uh, very few people will turn that down, even in today's times. Um, so Paul says to make the most of every opportunity. And that requires that we're looking and we're thinking and we're actively searching for opportunities to have, and the last one Paul says is that, let your conversation always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Now, this is really interesting because Paul's saying, so that you may know how to answer everyone, implies that people are asking you questions, which means that Paul is expecting Christians to live a questionable life. Not questionable in the sense that it's sketchy, like, yeah, he's kind of questionable. <laughs> but questionable in such a way that people want to know what is it about you that makes you live like this. Some of this is the way that we treat people who everyone else has discarded. Some of this is the way that we are quick to forgive when everyone else in society is quick to bury someone or hold a vengeance. It, it implies that we are living a questionable life. Now, Paul also, when he's talking about this, so we know how to answer everyone, a uh, quick homework assignment. I hate when people give me homework, but I'm giving you a little homework assignment. Um, if someone were to ask you, hey, what is the gospel? What is this hope that's inside of you? Would you know how to answer that? But one of the things that you can do is spend some time reflecting on and studying and thinking, how would I answer that question if someone asked me, man, listen, what's this Christianity thing all about? Isn't it just like all the other religions? How would you distinguish that? How would you be able to answer that? That requires that you and I um, get, get down and, and do some studying so that we are equipped to know how to answer people. Um, and this is all very personal stuff for me because I'm on a stage right now because of a woman who did these things, these four steps for me. Uh, when I was in college, uh, a woman named Veronica uh, that I was studying Spanish with led me to faith. I was not the person that was the prime candidate to come to faith. Uh, she and I became friends because I was trying to cheat off of her in Spanish class, <laughs> and she didn't let me cheat. And I was like, that is really weird. Like, why wouldn't you cheat? Cheating is the best part of college. Uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, and I was just so intrigued. Like, what is it about you that when everybody else is cheating, you refuse to do it? There was one project that everybody did, and then we all cheated together. This is before I became a Christian. Uh, <laughs> we all cheated together, and she would rather get a C with integrity than cheat and get an A. There was something about her. I'll never forget one night, we were in the library studying Spanish, and she asked me, could she you know, share her, her journal from that morning, what she had read, her devotional, and I said, please, go for it. She read something from her journal, and it, something about it hit me. Later, she invited me to church, um, and uh, a couple of guys from the church invited me to Bible study, and I found myself in the library in a different room, weeping my eyes out. 
I was crying so much that I stayed in the library for an extra hour because my eyes were swollen from all the crying I was doing, and I was embarrassed to go back to my dorm with my eyes that red. Months later, she told me something that has messed me up since then. She told me that every single day leading up to that point, she had been praying for me. She devoted herself to prayer for me. She made the most out of every single opportunity. She knew how to answer when I when I asked her about her faith, and it changed my life. You have no idea what God can do through your witness. For you are devoting yourself to prayer, to praying for someone, for you to make the most of every single opportunity, uh, to be wise in the way you act towards outsiders, and to know how to answer people, and trust that God can do something amazing with your efforts. Now, the second thing I want to talk about from this text is that we sometimes we we misunderstand God's heart. We misunderstand God's heart. So first, we misunderstand what it means to be a witness, and number two. Man, we just misunderstand God's heart. God's mission is to seek and to save the lost. There was a controversial scripture in Luke 19 where Jesus is with a man named Zacchaeus, and Zacchaeus was a tax collector. And for those of you who know about ancient、uh, Jewish history,、uh, how despised tax collectors were. Nicodemus was hiding in a tree, and Jesus says, "Hey, Nicodemus, come down because today you and I are going to Buffalo Wild Wings together." <laughs> the Pharisees are outraged. They're absolutely outraged that this hypocrite, this traitor to the Jewish people, is now somehow hanging out with this religious official who claims to be a holy man. And Jesus responds to him and says, "Today salvation has come to this house." Jesus told him, "Because he too is a son of Abraham." And here he tells him his mission: "For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost." This is why Jesus has come to seek and to save the lost. So often we miss out on God's mission because we're too worried about our own personal lives. A few months ago, my wife and I went apple picking,、um, uh, and uh, it was one of those annual traditions that we have. It's one of those places where you pay thirty-nine dollars and you get like seven apples. And、um, <laughs> while we were eating some apple cider donuts, which were delicious.、Uh, I thought my wife was watching my kids. My wife thought I was watching my kids, and our one and a half year old Josiah、uh, just went away. He walked away. Now we were in a sea of people. There had to be about 500 people out that day, and the look of fear that was in my wife's eyes, and the fear that I felt in my stomach, and he had been gone for about 20 or 30 seconds, and instantly your brain just goes to the absolute worst case scenario, and. It was the most terrifying minute of my life. One of my friends who was with us immediately jumps on the table and he goes high just to look out for for my son. And you know, about a minute after we were looking for him, my son was just kind of just walking around and and、uh, he had no idea what was going on. He didn't even know he was lost. And <laughs> and we picked him up and that was the best hug I've ever gotten in my life. And to put my face against his his fat cheeks after he had been lost was the single greatest feeling of my life, because my son, which was lost, it was now found. Every single Sunday, millions of Christians fill churches, and we sing songs, and we raise our hands, and we praise God. And there are those outside who are lost and perishing, and we don't even care sometimes. We misunderstand the Father's heart. God, our good Father. It says it tells us in Second Peter three and nine, the Lord does not delay His promise as some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. Every Sunday, our churches are full of people that sing praises to God. We have no concern for those who are lost, and I think it's because sometimes we misunderstand the heart of God our Father. God has come in Jesus to seek and to save. The lost, and He has given us this ministry of reconciliation. Now, if we misunderstand the Father, we run the we we run the risk of not caring about what God cares about.、Uh, and this was actually one of the biggest obstacles for the Pharisees.、Uh, they cared so much about dietary restrictions and healing on the Sabbath that they they lost focus of people. Don't ever let your version of 
uh, spirituality and your relationship with Jesus be one devoid of people. Yes, God calls us to love him with all our heart, soul, and mind, and strength. And he also calls us to love our neighbor as ourself. And how is it that we can love our neighbor as ourself if we watch the perishing world go and with no care for them? The last thing I think we misunderstand is we misunderstand the gospel. Uh, the word gospel literally means good news. Somehow we've turned it into good advice. In ancient days, after someone, uh, a king or a, a, a leader would, would conquer uh, another, another army or another force, they would come into, the t uh, come into town waving the banner of good news about all they had done, all that they had accomplished, meaning the battle has been won, the victory is ours, this was now the celebration. The gospel means good news about what God has done, of taking us from death to life by grace alone, not what you need to do. One of the things that stifles you being a witness and me being a witness more than anything else is that it's an obligation. It's just one more thing to do to feel bad about not doing enough. And we need to recover what the gospel is so that our hearts would be made to love more privately and that would turn into a public devotion. Here's what I know about good news. Good news is always meant to be shared. If it's something that we truly believe to be good news, we'll share it. Every January, uh, I go on a social media fast uh, just to get off of Instagram and, and Twitter and all those different things because it consumes so much of my time and I want to hit the reset button. But this year, I broke my own rule to post something on social media because it was just such good news. My mother, uh, who was the first female and first black judge in New Rochelle, where I grew up, uh, retired. And uh, I got to witness her swearing in my older brother who was taking over her seat. And the, the look of pride in her eyes, yes, thank you so much. <laughs> the look of pride in her eyes, the look of pride in my dad's eyes as my brother was being sworn in to be a judge, it filled me with so much joy that I couldn't wait to go and to share it. Good news is always meant to be shared. And I fear that we're not dangerous witnesses because I don't know that we've internalized the good news of the gospel. But the, uh, Jesus is good news. For blind Bartimaeus, who was forsaken and forgotten, when everybody walked past him, Jesus was the one who stopped to notice him. To him, Jesus was good news. To Peter, the failure, the one who talked a big game and didn't back it up, who said, Jesus, I'll follow you no matter what. If everybody else leaves you, I'm going to be right there with you. Jesus says, Peter, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. Jesus, after he is resurrected, goes to the disciples and said, hey, where's Peter? He said, he's in the back. Jesus goes straight to Peter to reinstate him. He says, Peter, son of John, do you love me? Peter, overcome with emotion, says, yes, Lord, of course I love you. Well, then great, go and feed my sheep. Fifty days later, Peter was preaching the most profound message in the, in, the, in, the, in the history of the church. To Peter, the failure, the gospel is good news. I wonder if there are enough of us who have ever tasted the beauty of the gospel to cover our sins. There's a psalm where it says, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he uh, hid our sins from us. I wonder if we truly believe in this gospel of good news that covers and comes to failures, not with condemnation, but with a hug. To Peter, the gospel was good news. To Jairus, the man who was desperate for his daughter to be healed, desperate with nowhere else to turn, Jesus was good news who could do exceedingly abundantly more than he could even ask or think. To the Samaritan woman who avoided everybody else, Jesus was good news. He was a gracious savior who knew the real her, and he wasn't offended by her. He was good news. To the prodigal son who ruined his life uh, by his decisions and came home expecting a lecture and at best case scenario, hoping for a job, got the party of all parties. To him, the gospel was good news. The list is long. My hope and my prayer is that you and I would rediscover the good news of the gospel, that it would permeate our hearts, 
and it will be something that we can't help but share. Let me pray for us. God, our good Father, I pray that you would reawaken our hearts to live in your gospel of good news, and we would share that everywhere that we go, that it would lead us to deep, deep, deep private love that manifests itself in public devotion to you. Yes, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.